For those of you who have not heard my story yet, <laughs> uh, I was uh, in a hurry running out to the car to get something about an hour and a half ago and took the corner too quick and zoop down I went and twisted my leg and um, it only hurts when I stand on it. <laughs> so, so oh, there we go. Um, but it's one of those things that's going to get better, I'm sure. And so, but tonight I uh, decided it probably best not to try to robe and I'll be sitting on the stool for the sermon so I don't get to wander around like I usually do. Uh, so, but it um, makes a person grateful for when things are working the way they should and reminds a person of that proverb we all know too well, haste makes waste, right? So, um, we're all ready to the fifth word of Christ from the cross already. Um, the first uh, four words of the cross uh, took time as, as Jesus was crucified and hung on that cross for him to share those words with, with the people there and for posterity for us as well. Uh, the last three end up coming in rather rapid succession. And so um, we're at the fifth word from the cross tonight I thirst. And Jesus, as a representative of us, knew what human suffering was all about, uh, endured those hours on the cross on our behalf. Today is also St. Patrick's Day, and we're going to weave that theme into the service because St. Patrick was a real person who did amazing uh, missionary work in the early years of Christianity and deserves to be remembered for the true things he did. So the first part of the service and the sermon is going to focus on the word from the cross. Uh, the latter part of the service uh, will be drawing in some of uh, St. Patrick's uh, prayers and, and, uh, and creeds that he had. And also I'll give a little brief uh, overview of St. Patrick's life that we can learn from today. Christ's word, I thirst. We thirst for the living God. We begin our worship with the opening hymn. O oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall declare your grace. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory, Glory be, be to, to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul pants for God, for the living God. When I go in the God. My tears have been my food day and night. These things I remember, as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God, under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise, among the best of the throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why am I so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. O Lord God, you are the ever-flowing fountain of life. Do not forget us in the trials of this life, but from the wellspring of your word, satisfy our thirst for you, that we come rejoicing to your holy mountain and drink from the river of life that flows from the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture readings for this evening focus on God as our wellspring of life and Jesus, the water of life. Reading first from Psalm 63, verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Psalm 69, 1 through 3 and verse 21. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the word from the cross is recorded in John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. At the crucifixion, knowing that everything had then now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We join in the singing of the hymn.
Jesus has been on the cross for six hours. And that's just from that time. As we look what Jesus has been through, going back to the day before, as he spent time with his disciples and as he tried to teach them what was to come and how they were so slow to catch on and so lack of involvement with what he knew was about to take place. Jesus had been with the disciples. He had tried to explain to them the meaning of what was about to take place. And he called upon them for their loyalty. Oh yes, they said they certainly would be there for him. They certainly would help him in his time of need. But where were they? They scattered. When Jesus went with them to the Garden of Gethsemane and there asked them if they wouldn't just pray with him for just one hour. Yet as he went forward to pray and sweat great drops of blood as he agonized through what was about to take place, he goes back to find them sleeping, not involved at all. Emotionally and spiritually, this is a drain on Jesus as far as what he is going through. And then he's arrested by the people he came to minister to, to reach out to, to the religious leaders who were supposed to know who he was. Emotionally, again, and spiritually, very exhausting and very overwhelming. And then, of course, the ridicule, the beating by the soldiers, the mockery, the crown of thorns on his head, the poking of the spears, and then the 39 lashes that ripped his flesh from his back. He is exhausted. And then he goes to the cross. He goes to the cross to have nails pierced his hands and feet. The jolt of that wooden structure being forced up and put into that hole to hold it. Hung there, his arms stretched out of joint, a little foot pad at the bottom of the cross to enable him to try to push himself up so he could get a breath, only to fall back again in exhaustion. It was all too much. Too much to see his followers, those who had given him allegiance, to turn their backs on him. To Peter, who vehemently said, Lord, though all else fail you, I will not, I'll be there to the end. He watched and heard as Peter had denied him. Jesus is totally and completely exhausted. He is literally dying of thirst. Now we're told that a person can only go so long without water. Under normal circumstances, I understand that three days is the limit, but Jesus has gone through so much more than that through his suffering through his sweating, through his ordeal. He's gone through all those things and, and his lips are parched. He's desperately, desperately thirsty. And the scripture is recorded, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked it with a sponge and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop and lifted it to his lips. You know, the scripture doesn't leave out anything that's important. In the Bible, you'll find what seems to be maybe just a, a minor incident, a, a passing reference, uh, but as you dig in a little deeper, you discover there's a real important meaning there. You notice that it brings out that when it came to bringing that drink to Jesus' lips, it says they put it on a sponge and lifted it on a hyssop branch. Well, that seems like kind of a minor uh, detail that could be mentioned, but in reality it's quite important. Why a hyssop branch? A hyssop is a uh, herb, a flowering herb that's used in purification and cleansing, kind of like a mint 
uh, bush. And uh, John the Apostle, in recording this uh, word from Christ from the cross, mentions that when they brought that thirst-quenching drink to Jesus' lips, they did so by way of a hyssop branch. Why is that important? Let me refer you to the book of Exodus chapter 12, where it talks about the first Passover, when the children of Israel were delivered from their slavery in Egypt, and the Passover lamb was sacrificed in order to put the blood on the door of the Israelites so that when the angel of death passed over Egypt, their lives would be spared. Remember that Jesus, our Lord, died on Passover day. Good Friday was Passover day, the celebration of that important event for the Israelites in their deliverance from Egypt in the Passover. Exodus chapter 12 says, when you put the blood on the door of your homes, take a hyssop branch, dip it in the blood that's in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with blood that is in the basin. In the Old Testament, 1,400 years before the death of Christ, when the people of Israel were to be delivered from Egypt as that Lamb of God was sacrificed to enable them to escape, the blood of that Lamb was placed upon the doorposts of their homes with a hyssop branch. Is it coincidence that Jesus on the cross to receive his drink as he bled there from a hyssop branch? I think not. I think God is tying together the reality that we see that Jesus, who's dying on the cross, is in reality the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, who has come to take away not only the sins of his people of the past, not only for the sins of the people of that present day, but the sins of of all people of all time, including you and I, and that the hyssop branch that delivered the people of Israel in the Old Testament was a part of the picture of Jesus, our Passover lamb, as he died on the cross, and his blood was applied to the doorposts of our hearts. Now, interestingly enough, this was not the first time Jesus was offered a drink at the cross. Both Matthew and Mark point out the fact that when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he was offered the customary drink of wine that had been infused with drugs. This was a common practice at crucifixion. It was meant to be a, a, a little bit of a mercy for the person who was being crucified, that they would be given a drug mixed with wine in order to alleviate some of the suffering and pain. When Jesus was offered that mixture of wine and drugs, he refused. He wouldn't take it. Why? Because he was facing that suffering and death on our behalf straight on, without any alleviation at all of the suffering that he would endure. And he knew taking that drug would do just that. He said no. The wine vinegar that he was offered later, just before his death, of which he did partake, because it was wine vinegar, even the alcohol content was no longer there, and it was simply a moisture drink that helped his parched lips. It also was in fulfillment of scripture. For Psalm 69 says, they gave me gall to drink, and in my death I thirsted. So Jesus, in taking that drink, was knowingly fulfilling scripture, which had foretold that that's what would happen when the Messiah died on the cross, and also showing that he endured that unbelievable throat-quenching thirst for us so that we need thirst no more. You know, water is so essential for life. Uh, the lack of water in a person's life causes dehydration, we know that. But dehydration is more than just being thirsty and wanting something to drink. Dehydration can cause physical failure, kidney failure, can actually lead to seizures, and actually cause swelling in the brain. A lack of water over a period of time 
has devastating effects on a person physically. Jesus was to that point, totally dehydrated. More than just hard day's work, I need a drink of something. No, he was dying of thirst. Water is also necessary to cause circulation of oxygen within our bodies. It also plays a crucial role in the digestion of food. Water is essential for life. Jesus went without that for us. And then, on the other side of the coin, Jesus tells us that he is the water of life for us. What is so essential to us physically, Jesus is spiritually. He is the water of life that fills our souls to overflowing. The trouble is, is that as human beings, we're thirsty, we know that, but so often we find other things to fill that thirst. We are attracted to things that really don't satisfy, but we think they will. Because we are thirsty, we have a void in our hearts and lives that needs to be filled with something. We turn to entertainment or, or false fulfillment through drugs or other means, uh, trying to put something in that spot. It doesn't work. The prophet Jeremiah said to the people of his day, my people have committed two sins. One, God says they've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and two, God says they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. That was true at that time in the Old Testament. It's true today as well. Human beings are apt to be attracted to the wrong thirst-quenching agents that may for the moment quench the lips, but in the long run, only bring more thirst and do not satisfy. It's like sailors lost at sea. And we know that, right? If you're lost at sea, don't drink the salt water. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink, right? Uh, but how tempting that must be when you don't have any water and you're dying of thirst and there's moisture all over, it's easy to understand how people might start to, to rationalize and say, well, certainly maybe just, just to quench my thirst a little bit, just a few drops on my lips, that won't hurt. Yeah, it will. Salt water is, uh, three seawater is 3% salt, and kidneys, in order to process water, can't do that over 2%, and if they receive that salt water, they have to draw a liter and a half of fresh water to process that through the system, and that forces extracting that from the body. <coughs> so that instead of helping in any way, drinking salt water actually will speed death because it robs the body of good water. And so salt water becomes the agent of death. And what a picture within our world how people are attracted to things that are only going to hurt, that are not going to satisfy, but are rather going to bring one to the point of desperation. But that's why Jesus came. He came and said, I am the pure water of life. He who believes in me shall receive within themselves a wellspring of water that will bubble up to eternal life. One day in his ministry, Jesus was going through Samaria, and he came by a well, a well there, and it was the middle of the day. Nobody else was around except this one Samaritan woman who was there to draw water. She was there in the middle of the day because most of the women came in the morning, and she was a bit of an outcast in that town and uh, wanted to avoid contact with others. She was there in the afternoon that Jesus was passing by. Again, no accident that he happened to be there this for him was an appointment. She didn't know that. But he comes to her and says, um, why, don't, uh, why don't I give you a drink of water? <laughs> how can that be? You have anything to draw with. Um, how can you possibly do that? Jesus says, well, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink because I can provide you with a, a water that will last forever. You drink from this well, you'll come back again. You'll need more. 
but the water I give is a well of water that springs up to eternal life. She said, how, are you greater than our ancestors who gave us this well? How, how can you say that? And then she gets into a conversation with him about the coming Messiah. She says, I know when the Savior comes, he'll, he'll tell us everything. He'll, he'll straighten us out. She said, you know who you're talking to? That's me. I'm the one. Suddenly she realized that he had been talking to her about her life and things that only he, she could know he knew. And as a result, she went into the town and said, told the people, come and see if this man isn't the one who has been promised. He's told me everything I've ever done. And he's offered me a drink from the wells of salvation. Jesus offers that drink today as well. From the waters of his eternal cleansing, he brings the waters of life that truly quench the soul. It's very interesting that our initial connection with God in baptism is water. God uses that element as a picture of his washing and cleansing and supplying our thirst. Something that is there not just at that moment in time when baptism takes place, but is the beginning of an artesian well of satisfying water, the water of life, that wells up within our hearts and lives our whole life, our whole time of relationship with God. Jesus says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of their heart will flow waters, living waters of life. And of this he spoke of the Holy Spirit who was to be given to his followers. In your life, God pours out his grace taps that artesian well of his love and overflowing mercy to be a part of your life each and every day. And when you find yourself being drawn to the salt waters of life that only harm you, Jesus says, come to me, and I'll give you a water that will wash away all of that harm and will produce within you a well of life that will be with you both now and forever. So what does this word from the cross tell us? As Jesus says, I thirst. Well, first of all, it shows us Jesus' humanity. It shows us that he truly was one of us. He knew what it meant to suffer. He knew what it meant to be thirsty. I mean, really thirsty, really hungry, really pain. All of those things that we as human beings go through, both physically and emotionally and spiritually, Jesus knew what that meant. And when he said, I thirst, he was saying, I'm one of you. I've been where you're at. I'm enduring it for you so that in me you can find your thirst quenched. And then secondly, Jesus' word from the cross, I thirst, shows how Jesus truly fulfilled scripture. Jesus knew what the prophecies were concerning his coming and he fulfilled them all right up to the very end. And this is one of them. In fact, John points that out when it's, he says, he, when a time had come, wanting to fulfill all scripture to the letter, he said, I thirst. Going back to Psalm 69, 21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. And Psalm 22, which we referenced last week, also references this where it says, my mouth is dried up like a potshed, like a piece of dry pottery, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and they lay me in the dust of death. Jesus' word from the cross shows he was truly fulfilling the word of God to the very letter. And this word of Christ from the cross, I thirst, shows us that because he endured that, because he experienced that to the full, we need thirst no more spiritually. He fulfills that longing in our hearts. In fact, getting thirsty for God is a good thing. The uh, theologian Augustine once said that we are thirsty for God until we find our thirst quenched in him. Nothing else. There's a God-shaped vacuum in every person's heart that only God can fill. And 
his word from the cross speaks to us that we can find our thirst for life, our thirst for him, our thirst for life eternal in him alone. Again, from the woman at the well, he says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Well water. But whoever drinks from the water I give them will never thirst. And the water I give to them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's God's promise. There's a... You know, my leg is getting a lot better. Thank you. Uh, There's a account from uh, the American West uh, about Desert Pete. You hear about Desert Pete? Um, he saved a lot of people's lives uh, through his uh, pump by his old cabin. But the story goes that there was a, a man who was going through the desert out in Nevada, and he started out one day just kind of as a joyride, and he's driving through the desert, not really preparing ahead of time, runs out of gas. Middle of the afternoon, temperatures in the 90s, doesn't really know where he is, thinks he does, but he's without gas, didn't bring any provisions along, he's lost. What's he going to do? He sat in his car for a while, hoping someone might come by this two-track dirt road, and nobody did. Finally, he decided, maybe I better go and see if I can't find something nearby for help. So he starts out. Not a good idea. He keeps going, he keeps wandering, he gets more and more thirsty, that desert sun beating down on him. He finally lost sight of where his vehicle was, he finally collapses in the sand. When he gains his composure and looks up, he sees in the distance what looks like an old shack. First he thought he must be just seeing things, mirage or whatever, but he thought I better go check it out, so he walks several blocks there to get there. He gets to this old shack. It's all broken down. It's for real. And outside the shack is a pump. It's a pump in the desert. He's overjoyed. He runs up to it. Oh, there's a pumping. Nothing. Then he sees an old soda can tied to the handle of the, of the pump, and he goes inside there, and sure enough, there's a letter. I just happen to have that letter. And in that letter, in that can, on that pump, this is what it says. This pump is old, but she works. Give it a try. I put a new sucker washer in her, even though the leather is probably dry. Next to the pump, you'll see a rock. Under that rock, you'll find some water. I left it there in a small bitters jar. Now there's just enough in that little jar to prime the pump. So don't go drinking it first. You just pour it in, pump like mad, and buddy, you'll get your thirst quenched. You'll have to prime the pump good, though. Work that handle like there's a fire. Drink, then once it comes, drink all the water you can hold, wash your face, cool your feet, but leave that bottle full for the next person. Bury it where you found it. Thank you kindly, Desert Pete. Oh, there's a P.S. Remember, there's just enough to prime the pump. Don't drink first. What would you do? Here you are, dying of thirst in the desert. You come across this pump. You dig up with this rock next to it, and there's a little bottle, probably a pint of water. And uh, you're told in this letter that there's just enough to prime the pump. And if you pour it down... Uh, the, the, the pipe, it, it soak up that washer and you pump, you'll get all the water you want. Can you believe it? Can you trust it? Oh, and remember, you're, you're dying of thirst and you see this little bottle of water. And, boy, it should be nice just to quench one's thirst a little bit, but you know if you do that and you don't, that's all you get, you're not going to make it out of here alive. But if you pour it in to the pump and prime it, you're going to have all the water you want. Do you trust Desert Pete? Or not? Jesus says, you can trust me. I am the water of life. Simply believe what I say, 
do as I tell you, and you'll have your life so full of water, you'll just be a splashing and a dracing all your days. But it's a matter of faith. Put your trust in him. Now, according to the legend, Pete was right. Desert Pete wasn't kidding. But according to the Bible, which isn't legend, which is the truth, Jesus is 100% right. And you can trust him to the very end, and he will give you a wellspring of life, just as he said, that will never run dry in his name. We continue with the singing of the offertory. share with you a little bit about St. Patrick. Remain seated just for a moment. Um, this being St. Patrick's Day, it's good to be reminded of the saints of old and how they have influenced the world at their time and also how their legacy influences us. Uh, St. Patrick was a real man. Uh, as time goes on, a lot of times there's legends and stories that get attached to them. Actually, in the years past when that took place, that wasn't meant to be deceitful. They were, they were kind of the action figures of the day, and they made up these stories about them, not thinking that people really believe them, but just what great people they were, why they, one of the things St. Patrick was supposed to have done was uh, chased all the snakes out of Ireland. Never mind the fact there never were any snakes there to start with, they know that from science. <laughs> Some of them are blessed without having snakes, but St. Patrick gets the credit. Those are the kinds of legends, kinds of things. But, St. Patrick really was a real person. I'd like to read just a couple of quotes from him. Uh, St. Patrick lived in England, uh, grew up there, uh, but was taken captive in one of the wars by pirates who brought him to Ireland at the age of 16. He was taken from his family uh, to work uh, in Ireland as a slave. This is what he says about that. I did not know the true God at the time. I was taken into captivity to Ireland with many thousands of people who deserved this fate because we turned away from God and we neither kept his commandments nor obeyed our pastors who used to warn us about our salvation. So as St. Patrick looked back, he saw this uh, terrible event in his life as really God's doing uh, for his good. While Patrick was working as a shepherd in Ireland, he underwent a conversion experience. It's kind of like King David. He was out watching sheep, he spent a lot of lonely nights, um, but it gave him time to reflect. He says this, The Lord made me aware of my unbelief that I might at last achieve and see that my sins and turn wholeheartedly to the Lord my God. He showed concern for my weaknesses and pity at my youth and ignorance. He watched over me before I got to know him and before I was able to distinguish good from evil. In fact, he protected me and comforted me as a father would his son. After six years of captivity, Patrick heard a voice telling him to go home. He said he was dreaming, and, and he heard a voice saying that if you go to the uh, coast, and he was almost 200 miles from the coast, says you'll find a ship waiting for you. So fleeing his master, he traveled to that port 200 miles away where he found a ship and persuaded the captain to take him in. Now in his early 20s, he returned home to Britain, and can, from there, since he had come to know God, studied Christianity, eventually being ordained as a pastor. Then he has another call from God. 
he recalls that after he went into the Christian ministry, he had a vision one night. He said, I saw a man coming, as it were, from Ireland. His name was Victorious, and he carried many letters. And he gave me one of them, and I read the heading, The Voice of the Irish. As I began to look at the letter, I imagined that very moment that I heard a voice of those very people, and they cried out as with one voice, We appeal to you, O holy servant boy, to come and walk among us again. Patrick went back to Ireland, this time as a missionary. He was 32 at the time, and he brought many to faith as he brought the message of Christianity to the native people living in Ireland at the time. He died March 17th, today, in the year 465, this is early years of the Christian faith. He was 92 at the time, and he had served as a missionary to Ireland, Ireland for 40 years. Towards the end of his life, he is quoted as saying, but I want all of you to know and sincerely believe that everything I achieved was not my own effort. It was a gift from God. So if you have a chance, maybe on... Uh, on the internet or whatever, look up uh, more information about St. Patrick. It's very fascinating. And in the close of our service, we're going to use some of his uh, prayers and, um, and, and creeds. Um, one thing I, I especially liked about St. Patrick uh, was uh, the, the shamrock, the, the clover, uh, how he used that to teach the people of Ireland who were not Christians when he got there to teach him about who God was. He was talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they said, how could that be? Three, one, what? This doesn't make sense. So he used the shamrock, the clover. He says, uh, how many shamrocks is this? There's one. How many leaves? There's three. <coughs> oh, three and one. Okay, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A good illustration, and he used this to this day as an illustration of the Trinity. Uh, also, the Celtic cross, which you know I left it up there. That wasn't too bright. I told you my leg was getting better. That's great. The Celtic cross, I think, is such a beautiful uh, picture of the cross. Um, it's a cross with a circle at the intersecting arms of the cross. You, I'm sure you've seen this uh, design of the cross. Well, there, yes, it is. Kind of the circle is the... Uh, uh, crown of thorns, but it certainly is the circle in the cross. Thank you. That's perfect. Very nice. See, we had it there all along. <laughs> perfect. Well, this was designed by St. Patrick, this particular design of the cross. Uh, the pagan people, the non-Christian people of Ireland, before they became Christians, were worshiping the sun. Jesus, of course, is the son of God, son in another sense. And St. Patrick said, say, I think we ought to change that around. Instead of worshiping the sun, let's worship the son of God. And the circle becomes a symbol for eternity. And in Christ, the son of God, we have eternity, the waters of life forever. So that design of the cross uh, kind of came out of that uh, mission work. One of my favorite stories, uh, still acting up a little bit, but one of my favorite stories uh, of St. Patrick, uh, which is a true story, is... Um, when he was presenting the gospel to the people of Ireland, he found it was best to reach the uh, clansmen, the, the, the kings of the family groups first. And then if they became Christians, the other people in the family group would listen. Uh, so finally he, uh, that's a real long story, but he finally uh, got a, uh, a man by the name of uh, King Egeus, uh to express faith in Christ. And he was delighted because this opened the doors for the gospel presented to many people. So he arranged for uh, the king to be baptized. And of course, that drew a clansman and all sorts of people to come and see this great king uh, turn to Christianity. And so as St. As Saint, Saint Patrick was going to uh, baptize him and, he, and the king was going <laughs> to lean over the fountain to have the water poured on his head, St. Patrick, and you often see him with his... Uh, cane, you know, his, his metal cane uh, with a little curve on the top, uh, leaned over and put his cane down not knowing that he was putting it on his foot, on the king's foot, and he punctured <laughs> the king's foot. And, oh, when he saw what he had done, he was just horrified. He thought, oh no, 
you know, I tried so hard to win this guy to Christ, and now I've gone and done this, and he's bleeding. He's going to hate me. And so after the baptism, he kind of took the king aside and said, I'm dreadfully sorry. I'm so sorry that this happened. Why didn't you say something? He said, oh, I thought it was part of the ritual. <laughs> so there's some humor in, in, in what takes place there, too. So uh, good, St. Patrick, a good guy. Uh, and uh, this is actually... Uh, prior to you know, Catholicism uh, taking over within the, in the Middle Ages. So um, he's one of our saints. You know, he's, he's really a Celtic saint, Celtic Christianity. Um, and um, we can share him with everybody, of course, but um, he's one of ours too. Let us rise now for uh, responses. And our responsive prayer is one taken from the writings of St. Patrick. Almighty and ever-living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are thankful that your word reminds us over and over again that you're always with us. Thank you for the gift of your spirit, that you live within us, bringing us life and peace. Thank you for your grace and favor. We praise you for the blessings that you so graciously pour out on us. For we look to you today, our Lord and Savior, our Rock and Redeemer. Our trust and security are in you alone. Though things may often feel uncertain around us, though darkness tries hard to steal our joy away, Thank you, Lord, that you are our firm foundation. We walk in your strength and victory, as you gave up our past and never our way. We praise you that you bless us and keep us, and that you make your face to shine upon us. We therefore commit ourselves to your care in the words of St. Patrick's breastplate. I bind unto myself the name the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and the one in three, of whom all nature hath creation, eternal spirit, spirit word, praise to the Lord of my salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is one that's taken from uh, that period of Irish history. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. 
we pray. Blessed Savior, whose lips were dry and whose throat was parched, grant us the water of life, that we who thirst after righteousness may find it quenched by your love and mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Let us bless the Lord. May the strength of God pilot you. May the power of God preserve you. May the wisdom of God instruct you. May the hand of God protect you. May the way of God direct you. May the shield of God defend you. May the host of God guard you against the snares of the evil one and against the temptations of the world. Christ be with you. Christ go before you. Christ be in you. And may the salvation of God, the Lord our God, always be yours this day and evermore. Amen. We remain standing for the closing verses. May God's blessings continue to go with us as we drink from the wells of eternal life. I don't know how many were able to be here this uh, afternoon for the food giveaway, but it was really quite a process. Um, there were two big semi-trucks loaded with boxes of food, which they put out on, in our parking lot. And then uh, there were several members from the church and then also their own crew that was here. Um, getting people organized as people came in, directing the traffic, so they lined up. I think there were four lines of distribution, and uh, as each person got uh, to where the boxes were, the people that were loading would take them and put them in the car for the person, and uh, people could take for themselves or for others, and it seemed to go so smoothly. When I first came by earlier, like about 12.30, I thought, oh boy, People are going to have to leave church and take a box with them tonight. <laughs> was not the case. Uh, things were finally distributed completely, uh, I think, by early afternoon. So uh, all things went well, and uh, I think it was a wonderful thing to do for the community and as a witness uh, for our church. I think that was wonderful. That went well. Any uh, special announcements? Thank you that I that you're on my you have me on your prayer list. I hope. <laughs>
Hey, good evening. How you doing? It's 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 the Irish day, you know. And uh, I want hope. I want hope. Hey, I, I want hope, and and you all can experience too the hope, the hope that's coming. We're gonna have hope. We're gonna be experiencing the hope at, at Zion Lutheran on uh, when is it? On Palm Sunday, isn't it? I on Palm Sunday, and it's gonna be a whole new experience, something you've never seen before. So you all be there. You're gonna enjoy it, and you're gonna experience true hope. That was good. <laughs>